I'm Keith Besserud. I'm a leader of a uh, small group of sort of computationally focused architects at uh, Skidmore Owings in Merrill in the, the Chicago office. And although the work of, of Black Box is, is definitely focused on sort of the subject matter here today, I, I thought that instead of talking about the work of our group, um, I would sort of step back a little bit and maybe address practice from a more general sense in terms of how it's being impacted by technology, at least from my perspective, um, through, through my career and, and from the, the, the point where I'm at right now in my career. Um, so I have a few just sort of topics that, that I'm going to um, sort of identify. Um, first being speed, and, and you know, obviously this is um, pretty understandable that how, how technology is affecting speed of things. And, and um, the efficiencies that, that we're seeing uh, develop through the use of technology um, are not playing out so much in terms of, of uh, how they you know, might affect the bottom line, you know, sort of profitability, but instead how they're, they're affecting the things that, that we're able to do as part of the design process and, and within the, the time spans that we have available on these projects to, to complete these tasks. And um, the, the uh, so the, the, the speed, is, you know, is, is allowing us to do completely new things that, that we haven't been able to do before, um, generate new ideas that we haven't been able to explore before, and, and um, produce a lot more information uh, as part of the design process that helps guide the design process. Um, and, and I think another sort of interesting thing that, that, that I, I've seen, you know, is the emergence of, of tools designed specifically for the design process. And, and obviously we've moved out of the, you know, sort of the production phase and, and you know, tools designed for ex expediting, you know, the development of, of contract documents and so forth. But now tools that, that are geared specifically for, um, you know, designing the search space much more efficiently. And within that, that, that family of, of tools, I think, you know, as this group is well aware of, is, is, is the availability of, of parametric uh, design tools, the ability to control complex geometries um, uh, very precisely and, and, and to iterate quickly through lots of different ideas of, of, of design thinking. From, from my perspective uh, in the office, what I've also noticed, I think, is, is that it's obviously, it, it has an effect on, on the way people think about design problems now. And so these parametric frameworks uh, coerce you to, to think about relationships about things um, much more than, than simply the, the objects themselves. And um, so it's moving people, you know, very much in terms of, of thinking in terms of systems and systems of systems. And, and it's not unusual for the projects in the office that are, are moving um, within this, this type of framework for people to have conversations about rules and, and to talk about rule sets rather than, um, um, you know, other types of ideas that, that, that we're more used to thinking about um, as part of a design process. Simulation tools are, are also becoming um, a fundamental impactor. Um, in, in the world of science, I'm, I'm aware of, of sort of a, a description of, of, of describing the history of science as, as a series of um, paradigm shifts in, in, in which the, the first paradigm is described as empirical testing, the, the, um, the use of experimental um, constructs to, to understand phenomenon. The second paradigm that followed was, was theory and, and the, the development of, of hypotheses and, and the development of the scientific method. The, the third paradigm that's described is that of simulation and, and it's it, it's sort of that fundamentally significant uh, that it's understood as a, as a whole new paradigm in science, uh, the, the way that it enables um, scientists to, to explore new territory through these simulation tools. And clearly, um, in architecture, we're in that same position now where we have a, a wealth of tools that are, are, um, have come available to us uh, that allow us to study things that we um, hadn't been able to study before and to measure them and to visualize them. And um, not only sort of the, the quantitative things, the, the more obvious things, but I think there's also a lot of work happening on the qualitative side of things as well. Understanding uh, things like aesthetics um, as, as a, uh, and diversity as, as a, a, an objective function uh, in an optimization problem, for example. <coughs> The introduction of all of these tools is, is obviously leading to a, a whole lot of information um, working its way into the, to the process. And um, 
in science, again, moving from the third paradigm, paradigm actually to the fourth paradigm, um, is one of, uh, of what they describe as sort of um, a data-intensive scientific discovery. Uh, the idea here is that, that there's a lot of data out there, and, and trying to convert that into information, into usable information, is, is, a, is a major challenge. Um, and it's recognized that, that the ability to do that will, will greatly um, empower science to make, make you know, great new discoveries. And, and again, in architecture, I think we're, we're, we're seeing the evidence of that same thing, where we, we have the availability of, of a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of tools to, to generate information for us. And, and um, getting you know, beyond sort of the overwhelming uh, proposition of that to, to, to use that um, in an intelligent way um, to help guide the development of, of our projects is, is something that, that we're um, you know, facing you know, in, in a very real way in, in our office, uh, certainly. Um, which leads to, to, the, to the next topic. Um, within Black Box, optimization has, has been a subject that we've been um, very focused on for, for quite a while. And, and initially, I would say, uh, from sort of more of an engineering perspective of, of sort of trying to find that, that singular solution that's the, the best answer for a problem, and moving beyond that, I would say now into a, a, an understanding of it as a serp search optimization problem where we're trying to, to find effective ways to sort of delve into the entirety of, of the search space and find all kinds of um, interesting terrain. Um, and then on top of that, I think also moving from the idea of search optimization for single um, objectives, it's easy to, to isolate you know, a, a problem as a structural problem or an energy problem or a, a financial problem. Um, when you try to simultaneously explore that space um, in, in search of the answers that address all of those problems, it becomes a much more difficult uh, proposition, and, and that's something that, that we're also, um, um, you know, that's something I see on the horizon that, that we're going to become uh, sort of much more invested in going forward. And related to, to um, I'd say most specifically, all of the, the simulation tools that are coming available um, is this idea of, of moving into a, a black box culture where um, you know, we have a lot of tools that are available to us that we're beginning to use that we have absolutely no idea how they work or, or what the um, assumptions are that, are that are made inside of them uh, that, that generate the results that we, we see. And um, you know, the idea of working with black boxes perhaps to, to some extent is, is nothing new. I mean, it's, it's a black box world, really. And, um, but, but the idea that, that we're, we're generating information that we're using to predicate um, designs upon um, is something that, that um, we're going to have to reconcile, you know, get comfortable with somehow. In, in our office, um, you know, we've been using tools in structural analysis for quite a while, and, and, and there's a lot of tools available that are, you know, well respected, you know, well used within the industry, uh, but there's still a very healthy culture in the office of, amongst our structural engineers of going back and checking with hand formulas, hand calculations, um, results that are generated. And, and I think there's, there's um, you know, as we move into you know, even more sophisticated, I think, you know, computational fluid dynamics tools and, and energy tools and so forth, um, our ability to get comfort with those tools and, and to, to understand um, that they're valid is, is going to be a, um, an interesting challenge going forward. Um, and, and, and like I said, I don't think there's, there, there's any sort of turning back from that. And, and even within our office, I think, um, and, and it's not just our office, I mean, across the industry, there's, there's, you see people developing their own tools in-house and, and, and sharing them with others. And, and I see sort of, a, to a certain extent, uh, um, a little um, trepidation uh, about using other people's tools. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, there's, there's definitely a, a preference for sort of creating your own tools when there's the opportunity. And that leads to this, this next point, then that you know, simultaneously with all of these, these commercial tools that are, that are becoming available for our use, um, there's also a very healthy interest in, in customization. And um, for the commercial tools that have an API um, available, there's, there's a lot of interest in, in getting in and using those in ways that, that the developers of the programs perhaps didn't intend, um, getting around assumptions that the developers of the tools made that, that might coerce you to work in a certain way and, and being able to work around that. Um, certainly, you know, customization tools that allow different programs to talk to each other so that we can share data across the process. Um, and then, uh, and also just, you know, sort of more purely algorithmic generative ideas um, for, for, for generating design studies. Um, there's, I'm seeing a fair amount of interest, um, you know, obviously at conferences like this it's apparent, but, but even within an office like ours, 
um, starting to see more and more of that. Another interesting development, ag again, sort of going back to the simulation tools, I guess, is, is um, this idea of performance expectations. I was talking with um, a colleague of mine uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was telling me about a, a lawsuit where, where a design firm is being sued uh, by an, a client because of um, a, a, a disappointment, I guess, in, in the, the energy bills that they were getting in their new building. And, and somehow, apparently, during the design process, they were led to believe that it was going to be something other than, than what it turned out to be. And um, of course, this ties into, I think, you know, we're seeing clients that are becoming much more sophisticated about the, the designs of their buildings. And um, they, they, it presents an interesting challenge because the, 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 the tools um, are being used more and more. And, and the visualizations that they create are, we find ourselves turning to, to them and, and incorporating them in presentations quite frequently um, because there is sort of this intrinsic um, quality to them that sort of makes them believable, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but but the, the whole issue of sort of managing client expectations uh, about the performance of the building I I is one thing, but I also think that it's just a sign of something that, that, that definitely is coming where there's uh, going to be an expectation that, that um, the architect be able to certify, um, you know, at higher and higher levels the, the performance of the buildings. And, you know, I think lead, you know, the, the whole lead certification process is, is sort of initial um, evidence of that. And I think it's going to continue to become, uh, you know, more and more sophisticated um, in that regard. The tools also, and then this one's perhaps uh, fairly obvious as well, but, but um, in, especially in the Chicago office of SOM where we have um, structural engineering, mechanical engineering, we have sustainability expertise, computational expertise, architecture, interiors, urban design, um, all of those disciplines um, in, in one house. And, and um, you know, we've always had the ability to sort of speak to people pretty easily um, across disciplines. The computer greatly enables that. And, and um, the, the, uh, the effect of that, you know, is, is, is a much more um, obviously integrated um, approach to, to conceiving and developing designs. Um, even the, the tools themselves are, are sort of allowing for, for crossover to some extent where the architectural people are, are using tools that, that may have been uh, originally intended for, for the mechanical engineers or for the structural engineers and, 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 and actually seeing sort of the, the nervous reaction um, that happens from, from those disciplines when, when the architects start picking up those tools. Um, in, 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 in SOM and, and probably in, in most large firms, because of the size of the projects, because of the size of the project's teams, there's a, a certain amount of specialization uh, within the design team you know, that, that seems to, to, to happen automatically. There's, there's folks that are um, more uh, involved on the, the, the conceptual design stage side of things, and then there's people that might be more involved in the technical side. There's, there's sort of this divide that's traditionally existed within the firm, and I think that um, these tools are also helping to, to break down that divide. I think that's an interesting see, thing to see within our firm. Um, the designers are becoming much more interested in, in topics that are sort of more technically, have traditionally been more technically regarded because of, of the, um, the way that the tools allow them to, to, to um, interact with that information in a, in a much more um, interesting um, and productive way. And then going beyond simply the, 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 the traditional design circle um, of, of um, collaborators, um, not so much in the projects at this point, I would say, but, but certainly in, in the research activity that we're doing, um, you know, the, the, the reach is going much further um, outside of architecture and, and getting into, you know, things like complexity science and math and biology and certainly computer science and, and a whole array of other, you, you know, it, it's becoming very easy to see the, the relationships of, of things going on in those areas to architecture. And perhaps it's always been understandable, but now there's tools um, making the ability to, to play in those areas um, uh, much, much more uh, easy to do. When I, was, uh, when I was a young intern, I can remember, um, and, and this was just before um, computers really began to take hold um, and everybody was still on, on drawing tables, at, at the time of a deadline on project, um, it was all hands, and, and even, this, even the senior um, designers and, 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 and project people would be involved in, in cranking out drawings in order to meet these deadlines. Um, 
nowadays um, in the office when there's a deadline looming, um, it's pretty much the younger people that, that are working the late hours um, cranking because of the fact that the senior designers, uh, senior technical people don't have the computer skills. And um, so it's creating sort of an interesting stratification that way. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, even, even the ones, the young folks that, that, are, that have those skills, as they get older, as they continue to mature, new tools are gonna come available. And if, if there's not a, a sort of fundamental um, adjustment to the thinking about the idea of continuing education and, and ongoing training, the, the, the same thing will just continue to propagate. And, and so I think that, um, you know, as you know, the continuing you know um, uh, reception of, of these tools is going to change that aspect of of, um, of, of, of practice to a, to a great extent. Um, two more slides, um, bottom up and top down. Um, so so with these parametric frameworks, with with things like agent based modeling, we're seeing um, an emergence of emergent um, design and 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 the idea that that we work with. A, a system of rules that is able to generate design as opposed to a more traditional approach where we establish a vision and then sort of work methodically to, to bridge that, that, that gulf between where we are and where we want to be. Um, going forward, I, I think that, that, that both are important. I don't think that, that this, this bottom-up idea is going to push out the top-down idea. I think, in fact, from a top-down perspective, there's something quite valuable about um, the idea of sort of irrational optimism, this idea that, that there's something I want to do. I have no idea how I'm going to do it, and, and it sort of forces something to happen um, in many cases that's quite remarkable. Um, on the other hand, the idea of sort of accepting you know, certain types of, of, of restrictions and constraints and, and working within that space to, to generate something interesting is, is equally valid. So I think that, that both of these ideas will be able to coexist. And finally, one last word, on, um, which is about research and, and an observation that, that I think research is because of the tools to a large extent, um, because of the, the, the ability to network nicely and easily with other disciplines, I think research and the formalization of research and practice is something that, that, that we're seeing evidence of, of becoming um, more and more um, prevalent. So that's it, thank you.